Okay. Okay. Good afternoon. This is June 3rd, the 130th birthday uh, anniversary of Roland Hayes, the great uh, African American um, musician, um, composer, I think, as well, but certainly. Uh, um, uh, yeah, the, the life of Christ song cycle. That's right, um, and uh, also the birthday of Evelyn here. Uh, so uh, that's a <laughs> so um, so it's June third, twenty seventeen. No, she's it's not her hundred and thirtieth. No, that would, that would be setting records, uh, and many more, as they say. Um, so my name is Brian Lance. I'm here on behalf of the Schiller Institute, uh, and uh, uh, and this is a uh, going to be a strategic update. We have a lot going on. Um, I'll try to keep this short and concise, um, as opposed to a class. As I said, this is going to be uh, a strategic update, um, particularly for our people in the uh, uh, who are watching this at home or at work, uh, as the case may be. Um, in terms of the most recent developments, we've got a new paradigm taking hold. Um, Helga Zepp LaRouche, uh, the first uh, uh, slide there, Mike, can we put that first one up? Yeah. Okay. Um, Helga Zepp LaRouche, as many of you know, uh, has uh, been in China. She's back, uh, but she was in China again since the Belt and Road Forum, um, May 14th and 15th. Uh, she came back, then she's back again in China for, the, for two weeks, um, and as reporting back, really, the, uh, the result of, of all of that uh, work through, through much of May, um, that uh, a global realignment is underway, and more than that, that it's virtually unstoppable at this point, that we have a just new world economic order coming into being, uh, the, the uh, work of uh, uh, the LaRouche movement over uh, 50 years now uh, is coming to fruition because of, uh, in particular, the initiative of President Xi Jinping of China uh, and his specific effort, the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, uh, when Helga was emphasizing that this is becoming almost unstoppable, she's referring not only to the 60 nations that are officially part of the Belt and Road Initiative across uh, Asia and Eurasia and into Africa, um, but as well the global complex of, uh, of, of arrangements uh, of a total transformation in terms of goodwill among nations, which is occurring, which is taking mankind out of the geopolitical domain. Uh, the domain of British geopolitics. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. I have no permanent uh, friends, only permanent interests. Uh, this kind of cold-blooded, cold imperial calculation to maintain uh, a unipolar world um, is broken, uh, and not only broken, but being replaced rapidly uh, by a multipolar world, at least some would call it a multipolar world, uh, President Putin uh, referred to it that at the at the St. Petersburg uh, International Economic Forum this week, um, um, but it's a Westphalian uh, arrangement uh, of cooperation among nations uh, as nations, uh, and each seeking the in interests and the advantage of the other as the best way of securing your own um, your own future. So this process is is now underway. Um, uh, just a, a, a one indication of this, the, uh, some of you know the Wharton School, um, uh, in one of their newsletters on May 30th, put out a, a, uh, a, a review titled, U.S. Needs an Asia Play to Prevent China Dominance. Um, uh, and what they point out, this is, these are their figures, but that China's banks, this is its banks, um, and this is very much what the Belt and Road Forum centered around. You can uh, 
move on from that slide or just take that slide down for now. Um, uh, the um, the um, uh, the uh, China Chinese banks, the XM Bank, other banks in China, have committed over three hundred and twelve billion dollars in hard loans, hard agreements um, for infrastructure outside of China in the course of the last approximately three years, uh, three, three and a half years. Um, and they compare this to the total made by other international lenders. The other international lenders include these new institutions emerging, like the uh, New Development Bank of the BRICS nations um, uh, and the uh, AIIB. But all of these other international institutions, IMF, World Bank, um, um, uh, Asian uh, um, Infrastructure Bank, and so forth, um, a total of eight billion. So 312 billion over three and a half years have been committed by China banks outside of China for projects versus eight billion for all the other institutions combined. So, so th this is the this is the the this has incredible consequences around the world. We'll come back to a couple of them very quick. Um, but this was consolidated with the Belt and Road Forum, the consolidation of this process that began in 2013. Now we also had this last week. Then we had June 1st through 3rd. We had what I've just mentioned, the Saint Petersburg International Economic Forum. Um, 8,000 people, um, uh, President of India, Modi, the President of Austria, other leaders of nations were there collaborating. The U.S. had a delegation of over 300 people uh, that included, um, and you can put up, yes, there's the Belt and Road Forum. Thank you, Mike. Um, uh, uh, you had a separate Russia-U.S. business dialogue addressed by President Putin, among others, um, in which he appealed to American business leaders to support President Trump and the administration, the new administration of the U.S. government. Um, and uh, um, uh, I think I want to just underscore a, a little part of his remarks. Now, keep in mind, I mean, when Obama was around, there was no, virtually no U.S. participation in the annual forums. These are the equivalent of the Davos Forum, roughly, but held in uh, St. Petersburg. Um, uh, the U.S. government didn't participate under Obama, but as well, U.S. companies were uh, browbeaten uh, into staying away. Uh, now, we had 50 U.S. corporations that participated, uh, and the U.S. ambassador to Russia participated. And so it's an entire, entire transformation. And in part, Putin said, thank God um, uh, uh, for this process. He, he emphasized that while U.S.-Russian relations, bilateral relations, have, have, you know, are, are, are at the lowest of low points, um, down below that, the lowest since the Cold War, he said. However, the Russia and the United States have maintained a dialogue within the framework of various um, well, in various formats. He mentioned the Group of 20, the APAC, um, Asian Pacific um, uh, grouping, and other fora that were have been the basis where the U.S. and Russia have been able to maintain contact. And I'd also emphasize you have the ongoing process now of U.S.-Russia deconfliction uh, in Syria and a, a broader cooperation that's emerged there as well. Um, so he said, this, this at least has operated, you know, and, if, and, and thank God that it has, because if this had, had gone away, uh, well, you know, we might not be here at yeah. this moment. Yeah. Um, so, um, but this was the part of the Russia-U.S. business dialogue of the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. So, um, so there was, um, uh, so I gave you a sense of that. Um, in terms of participation. Uh, a lot of economic deals, both in terms of the Belt and Road, Road Forum, May uh, 14th and 15th, uh, and then uh, in St. Petersburg, June 1st and 3rd. 
Um, there, India and Russia have signed another deal for two more nuclear power plants. This is part of a, a package of 12 to be built within the next 20 years. Some of them are already, two have already been constructed. The total will be a package of 12. Um, these are one gigawatt each power plants. These, these, are, these are major, major projects, each of them by themselves, while we're shutting down nuclear power plants in the United States, ironically. Um, um, and one thing that was stressed throughout, and Helga was pointing to this, Helga Zeppelarusha was pointing to this as well, rightfully, is the integration process that's going on here. Um, uh, President Xi Jinping, uh, President Putin, other leaders are, are stressing the integration of the Belt and Road process uh, with uh, the Eurasian Economic Union, which includes Russia, Armenia, some of the Stan countries and so forth, uh, and also the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, which includes much of Asia and which Pakistan and India both are, are joining or expected to join this year. So that what you have coming together is a co complete uh, alignment, uh, despite all kinds of differences, despite different cultural backgrounds, you, know, you name it, a complete alignment of all these nations across Eurasia and reaching into Africa. Um, uh, could you put up the next, uh, that's from the uh, G20 summit last year. Uh, another key uh, moment in this process, this organizing process. Uh, go on to the next. And um, and this is the land bridge that uh, that uh, we have been emphasizing, the uh, the new Silk Road, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative can be transformed into, uh, linking across the uh, across the uh, Bering Straits there, at the lower um, more or less the lower center of your picture if you kind of adjust to the uh, to the topology here. Uh, you see you're looking down from the Arctic, more or less, down on the rest of the world, and how that can be linked together through high-speed rail and maglev rail and so on and so forth, interconnecting the world uh, and its cultures and peoples. Um, the next one, all right, Kenya. Now, on May 31st, the president of Kenya inaugurated the Mombasa to Nairobi Railroad, um, uh, 472 kilometers, so around 300 miles roughly. Um, uh, this is from Mombasa, the port uh, on the uh, on the uh, on the uh, well, I guess you could say on the Indian Ocean, um, and inward to the capital of Nairobi. This will reduce costs of container shipments by half. Um, uh, this is a heavy-duty railroad, electrified railroad. Uh, it'll move freight, cargo, and also it's moving people. You can see here the cheering people seeing, uh, seeing the first railroad. Um, I think it's coming in to Nairobi. Uh, go on to the next. I think there's another. We got one. Here's the. Here you have some some <laughs> selfies being taken <laughs> at the. Uh, at the, at, the, at the very start of, uh, the, uh, of this railroad. Um, maybe there's one more, I can't remember. Well, yeah, well, this is worthwhile. So, so this gives you an idea of what you're talking about. In the lower uh, right-hand corner, you see Mombasa on the coast, on the Indian Ocean. And then you see going up diagonally up to Nairobi in the larger black letters, of course. Uh, that's the railroad uh, that's just been completed. Right? Um, this was financed by the Export-Import Bank of China. We don't even have an ex Export-Import Bank fi uh, functioning at this moment. Hopefully, we'll bring that back quickly. But this is, these are the kinds of projects that are being financed by China's bank. In this case, China's banks. This is the XM Bank of China. Um, now, what's also been announced um, is that later this year in Uganda, you see Uganda over there to your... Uh, to your left, more or less in the center of the picture, you see the capital Kampala of Uganda. And then if you go uh, straight east, you see Malaba uh, right on the border. Uh, and the president of, of uh, Uganda has announced that they will begin construction of a railroad from Kampala to Mal Malaba. And then phase two from Kenya's capital going uh, northwest will link and therefore the railroad will link from Mombasa to Kampala 
and all, ultimately beyond that through the Congo, ultimately uh, north to Juba through South Sudan, on up to, to Cairo. In other words, you begin building a, a, a complete uh, wow. a rail system um, across uh, across East uh, East Africa and going west and as well as north ultimately. Uh, so that gives you some sense of this. Now, keep in mind, look over here on on the very right corner of your map. You see Somalia, and then uh, at the top you see Ethiopia. Let's go to Ethiopia for a minute, just to re as a reminder. Back in February, February 8th, they inaugurated the next. Uh, uh, they inaugurated the Djibouti to Abbas Abba, Addis Ababa railroad. Um, Djibouti being the the uh, major city state port in the area. It's a separate city state, um, uh, but Ethiopia is essentially otherwise landlocked. Um, and this railroad was also financed. 90% uh, financed by the Export-Import Bank of China, and that was inaugurated February 8th. That's a 750-kilometer uh, railroad, about uh, a little less than 500 miles. Um, again, electrified, and uh, uh, the first electric rail in Africa to connect two countries, in this case, Djibouti and, and, uh, and Ethiopia. Now, again, Somalia. Think of Somalia, this... this this quote-unquote failed state. Exactly. Huh? Um, how do you dry out this as a, 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 a festering ground for terrorism? Um, exactly by surrounding it with economic development. You begin to transform, you know, you're transforming the whole region. You're transforming a good chunk of a continent. So, uh, so looking back, if you go back to the 1990s, you know, under the direction of the IMF, International Monetary Fund, the Somali shelling, I mean, the country was already in trouble, but their, their currency called the shelling, um, was devalued uh, in the early 90s by approximately 1,000%. Overnight, the economy of, of Somalia was literally destroyed, just literally destroyed. Uh, you know, that meant that kerosene, which was as an import, which was relied on, you know, went up by a thousand percent, the cost, right? I mean, that's one way of thinking about it. The exports from Somalia out into the world, you know, the during foreign exchange to buy the things they needed for imports, went down, you know, by roughly a thousand percent. So, so you know, nothing functioned, right? And and this is this was the coup de gras to the collapse of the uh, of Somalia. Um, in other words, things don't just happen. Countries don't just fail, right? This is this is not a failure of, of another country, you know, as some that we're in some Hobbesian geopolitical universe. Um, this was the outcome of actual policies that were imposed, genocidal policies. Uh, you had a question? Uh, yeah, the IMF, right in conjunction with, you know, major banks and so forth. But yeah, it was the IMO. So, um, yeah. the IMF and the World Bank, are they kind of the same thing or they can just, do you know any, I don't know if you know that, I'm an apologist for throwing this out there if you, you know, not prepared, but. Yeah, let, let's um, leave it, let's leave it to, to later. Okay. I mean, the IMF, yeah, they're, they're, they're complementary. the IMF, um, uh, the World Bank supposedly nominally makes loans for economic development. Okay. Um, the IMF essentially coordinates policy among banks um, and creates the, the conditions, preconditions, pre defines conditions, defines policies okay. as essentially a, 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 you could call it in a certain way, a kind of consensus process among the major power major powers that have existed in the transatlantic region uh, since the end of World War II. Okay. Um, Roosevelt's intention was that the, the, the IMF and World Bank would become, uh, would be instruments for economic development, development of the world. That, that the enormous capacity the U.S. had built up in the course of World War II, industrial capacity and so forth, would be transformed mm -hmm. into an export capacity. 
that would then transform countries, uh, the newly decolonized nations, right? So newly independent. Nations. If, if it was intention. Is but of course, Roosevelt did, died before the end of World War II, and and uh, these institutions were immediately um, hijacked and increasingly so to to imposing IMF conditionality. IMF conditionalities are, you know, they decide. Obviously, they're doing it in, in conjunction with other international financial institutions, the big money-centered uh, banks, uh, um, um, you know, New York, well, uh, London, and so forth, Paris, and so forth. Um, these uh, conditionalities are always from the standpoint of co currency devaluation and, uh, and, uh, and therefore uh, imposing a looting policy on countries. In other words, every time you tell a country to devalue its currency, to, to supposedly improve its ability to carry out, to increase its exports and, and earn foreign exchange. In a, in a developing country, so there's, no, there's no, you devalue the currency. It means everything they have to import then immediately goes up. And what they're exporting, yeah, it sells for less. So they're, they're selling it for less than the cost that it actually wow. is involved to produce the coffee, the, you know, the raw materials or whatever in the first place, right? So, th so these countries have been, this is why, this is the cause of the conditions in, in the nation states in Africa, for example. You know, and it's, uh, and, uh, it, it, what, it's part of what makes China so important and unique is that they broke this strangle. But that's another, I mean, that's another story, but that's, um, but they're, they're unique in that way. Um, um, but I was, so Ethiopia, now, Kenya transforming the region, the potential for Somalia to, to, uh, um, to also pull itself back together as a nation, you know, is, is created as a byproduct of this process. Um, so anyway, I hope that, that helped answer your question. So. Um, um, okay. Genocide, depopulation. All right, something else happened this week. Everybody's heard about it. You know, they're hysterical about it. Uh, President Donald Trump pulled the U.S. out of the uh, Paris Agreement, or Paris Accord, as it's already called. Um, the uh, the whole um, decarbonization um, mojo, the whole the, the whole the whole hype around it, um, has uh, been thrown in, and I'm being told to to promote <laughs> this report: global warming square scare. Global warming scare is population reduction, not science. With with the, this uh, Adams family type photograph of, <laughs> of the Queen and um, and her consort there, uh, and this report, which EIR put out, I think three years ago now, four years perhaps, uh, is documents both the the in in, a, in with some brevity the science behind the uh, global warming hoax actually takes that those arguments apart but also in the first part comprehensively goes through how the entire environmental movement including the the institutions and individuals that promote um, uh, promote uh, the anthropomorphic climate change idea how this was developed as a doctrine of population reduction in other words, that's the elephant in the room that nobody talks about, is what is the intention behind the promotion of the global warming hoax and the uh, promotion, therefore, of having to decarbonize, supposedly, uh, that we got to get rid of plant food, and, um, and, and therefore reducing the capacity of, of uh, the earth to support people therefore leading to mass death. This is not, uh, as this report uh, goes through, uh, and we presented it in many other ways as, as well, but this report um, goes through it, the Executive Intelligence Review report, um, that this was uh, developed as a deliberate policy. Well, now we're, we're pulling ourselves out of this. The U.S. has withdrawn itself. The irony, uh, however, there's, I mean, there's all kinds of ironies in this situation. First of all, the, the Paris Agreement is not a treaty. It's not a treaty. The, 
a U.S. treaty under the Constitution has to be ratified by the Congress. And, and uh, instead, the, the, uh, the Paris Agreement, this all gets lost in the, you know, in the mumbo jumbo and so forth of the media. Yeah, the, the Paris Agreement uh, was an executive order by President Obama. He said, I'm going to make this, you know, I'm going to declare that we're part of this agreement by signing this, this piece of paper. Um, so it's not even a, a, a treaty. Um, and, uh, and, and that's just something to keep in mind because it was known, and Obama said it at the time, President Obama said it at the time, that it would not pass the Congress. In other words, he couldn't get, he, it would have never passed the Congress. We could have never entered into a treaty. So he decided, well, I'm going to do it by executive order, and everybody else went along with it. I mean, sure, the, you know, go along to get along, you know, the American uh, disease. Um, uh, at least it's been the American disease of late. So, um, so now we're getting out of this. Um, and, and, you, and we're revisiting some of these old horror story uh, stories. Uh, if you remember Al Gore, uh, back in 2006, put, six put out, uh, sick also too, uh, put out that movie, Inconvenient Truth. He wrote a book, or at least he, with the help of a ghostwriter, he wrote a book. And then he put out the movie, Inconvenient Truth. That was 2006. And in it, he said that sea levels were going to rise 20 feet 20 feet in a in the near future. All right. This is 10 years later. Ten years later. <laughs> Looking around, have you noticed? You know, he actually went so far uh, a couple years ago to actually argue that Hurricane Sandy in New York proved he was right, as if sea rise and a hurricane were the same thing. You know. Um, so okay, but so we just had. We just had along in the same vein, we just had Governor Jerry Brown of California, right? You might have heard him on NPR the other day. What's he smoking now? Yeah, <laughs> what's he smoking now? Yeah, well, let's, um, um, saying that sea, sea levels will rise in the next 80 years by six feet. Sea levels will rise by six feet in the next 80 years. You know, just... When you see, when we find out, when you have, when this happens, then, you know, in other words, this is what Trump is bringing on. So Jerry Brown is now on a plane to China, thinking he's going to get China to buy into this, this climate hoax business. Um, uh, you know, um, so, I mean, I mean, these, they're all coming unhinged. All of these, you know, all, of, all these people that have been promoting these, these myths, right, these these, um, you know, I don't know what, what um, these, these, this, these, the, the cultural, huh? The counterculture. You know, there is cult beliefs of the counterculture, you know, uh, relating to, you know, man is a monster de devouring the, the planet or, or, you know, we should all, you know, we should grow and use dope and, and we'll all be happy then. And, 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 you know, and do your own thing and, whatever, uh, you know, goes, and soon there'll be 20 sexes. I, I saw some articles saying that there's good, and there's now, well, there not, may not be just transgender, there may be, you know, many more varieties, wow. and we have to, you know, <laughs> you know recognize, <laughs> Heinz 57, somebody said. I, anyway, I mean, the point is, all of, they're all going nuts now, because all of that, you know, is, is, is it just turning into fairy dust. I mean, it's one way, of, I think, of saying it. And um, Just out here, Al Gore, Gore I'd like to uh, wonder <clears throat> how often Al Gore's record for his own uh, truth and, you know, like, you know, if you want credibility, then you live, you speak, the walk the walk. So, like, at least Jimmy Carter on the White House put up the, the panels of uh, whatever, solar panels. Uh, Al Gore, does he live in a very a, a house that you know has like, like no washer and dryer, yeah, no, 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 no electricity, yeah. air conditioning? Yeah. Yeah. Is he walking the walk? Or well, well, again, I, I, I mean, I, I don't want to go too far off and too okay. too many tangents. I guess I, partly I'm raising tangents as I go along, and it's my own fault. But um, yeah, uh, do you remember there was an old song, um, you know that. Uh, I owe my soul to the company store, yeah. right? 
um, 16 tons and a, how does it, well, they, yeah. 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 yeah, 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 yeah
north, the Amtrak lines, and so the Pennsylvania station is owned by Amtrak, um, uh, running north, all you know, to Bo all the way up to Boston, uh, but also also the suburbs, you know, to the north, Connecticut, and so on and so forth, right? But then the railroads through Penn Central run on down to Washington D.C., right? So uh, so this is you know the center of this whole complex of, of the New York of, of the Northeast. Uh, you know, the New York metropolitan area is, uh, is, is uh, a little shy of 20 million people. Um, the city is a, roughly 10, 10 or 11 million people. Um, but every day, the city, uh, there's an influx of, of about 600,000 people into the city. Of course, a similar number are leaving every night. And, um, but also, there's the, the uh, Manhattan, the, the, the the little area down by Penn Central, uh, by Penn Station, the Manhattan area itself, Manhattan District itself, more than doubles uh, because people are coming in from the other boroughs like Brooklyn and so on and so forth into Manhattan to work. So the, the city goes from one and a half to around three and a half million people every day and then it empties that out again. So it's an enormous number of people, 300,000 people come over from New Jersey every day um, and then back out at night. Well, these tunnels are 100 years old. Uh, the tunnels uh, into New Jersey and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, our, our Amtrak officially um, assesses that those, those tunnels are going to have to be closed within the next 20 years because they're simply, you know, they're gone. Uh, they're, they're operating at full utilization now, over full utilization, and they're, try they're patching them as, as they're being maximized for usage now but even uh, this is just patchwork and the whole thing is just giving way wow. uh governor christie of new jersey canceled two years i think it was two years ago two or three years ago the building of a new tunnel because it would cost too much yeah. well the, a new tunnel would have allowed them to close one one of the old tunnels you know once it was completed the new one so then the, the old tunnel could be completely rebuilt right but if you're the only two tunnels you have are both being fully utilized every day and you have no, you know, you have no other, no third option, you're stuck. Uh, and that's, uh, that's just coming in from, uh, from New Jersey. Uh, similarly, L line in, into Long Island will have to be closed later uh, this year, but go on to the next slide. I just want to just give it this, this is, <laughs> I mean, I just want to, you know, I put this up here just to give you uh, a sense of Penn Central uh, station. Those are the lines. There's 21 existing lines. The the ones in the lower, on the on the right, in, in red on the on the lower part of the right, uh, is is a, a proposal, the Gateway project. It's a proposal to substitute for Christie's, but it Governor Christie's, but it doesn't have any financing yet. Amtrak's working on the idea, but it, you know it's a, it's all snafu'd up with with, uh, you know, getting other government agencies and the EPA approvals and so on and so forth. So they got to call up Xi Jinping. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's right. But look, I mean, this is Matt, you know, it's 21 rail lines into Penn Central, right? East, West, North, South, and so on. And, and uh, these uh, tunnels going uh, east into uh, to the boroughs like Brooklyn and so on, but also to Long Island, they're going to be undergoing uh, shutdowns this summer uh, for repairs uh, for extended durations. So, so there isn't going. To, people aren't going to be able to move on these rails. You know, there's not going to be sufficient capacity. They're already maxed, uh, and they're shutting them down because they they they're long overdue. They they've got to do it. Um, at the same time, Penn Station itself has had two derailments. So they're now moving ahead and they'll be closing three of these rail lines at a time for extended repairs uh, over the summer period. So at any given moment, three of the 21 lines are gonna be closed. Plus rail lines through tunnels going into the boroughs and Long Island are gonna be closed. Anyway, you begin to get the picture. So, so, so rail lines, so Amtrak has announced the various um, 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 uh, regular service from Wash from uh, Penn Central to Washington D.C. are going to cease to operate over the course of this period. 
Other lines are going to be shortened. New Jersey is going to have to reroute uh, to Hoboken from, from uh, the Newark or the New Jersey Penn Station. At, I'll call it an annex to Hoboken, and people are going to have to catch a ferry or another rail into, into the city. Uh, in other words, this is, this is just a whole mess. Um, and we're forming a task force in New York. This is well underway uh, to, to, to lay out how this has to be addressed in the context of the Belt and Road. But that's just, uh, I don't think, is there another one? I, I, I think that's, well, that, and that's the subway system. Right, which is also, I mean, if you've been in the New York City, I mean, you know, it's rattling away. I mean, um, you know, again, I mean, it's, it's long overdue for replacement. Um, so let me, um, just to point out what can be done, just very briefly, you can, you can take that down, I think, for, for now. Um, um, out in California, we have the Oroville Dam. They're up in the very northern part of, of the state. Uh, on the Fer Feather River. And that dam, which is the highest dam in, in the United States, one of the highest in the world, I'm sure it's not as high as the Three Gorges, but anyway, 770 feet. Um, as you know, this last, uh, a few months ago, um, in, uh, er in the spring, early spring, um, the spillway of that dam, not the dam itself, but the spillway, an auxiliary still spillway, uh, began to crumble. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and it looked like this could lead to a washout of the dam itself, or at least that was dramatized. And there was an emergency called over 200,000 people had to exit their homes, you know, on, on brief warning, uh, clogging the roads. I mean, and people panicked because they were told to leave, you know, that the, you know, they were under the impression the dam could go at any time. And here they were stuck, you know, sitting there, uh, unable to do anything, unable to even move on the, on the roads. I mean, really a horrendous situation um, here. However, so again, I mean, this is part of the crumbling infrastructure of the United States. Um, but on the other hand, what would, has been done um, in response, as, as some of you already know, uh, gives you an idea of how rapidly we could move if we really wanted to move on this situation. Um, on April 6th, Governor Jerry Brown, the guy who's who's now on a plane to China, you know, trying to sell sell, sell his his uh, <laughs> lunacy over there, uh, was you know had to sign. There was no options. Had to sign an emergency order, executive order, directing the state agencies of California to make the repairs on the dam that had to be made before November first. Hmm? And uh, in doing so, you know, various um, EPA requirements, state level environmental requirements, and so on and so forth, were just thrown in the dumpster, right, under emergency rulings, orders, right? And um, beginning in May, uh, the construction phase began. Uh, there was a brief period of, uh, of, of uh, bidding. Uh, uh, the bidders were determined. Uh, the project was uh, laid out. Um, the construction phase began in May, May 13th, uh, which was when the emergency officially ended. Um, there are now cement plants being built on site. Um, uh, they're working 20 hours a day. Um, and, um, uh, and you'll have 500 workers on the, on the uh, site by August. You have 200 there. Now, roughly May 25th, there was 200 employees now working 20, 20 hour. I'm sure they're rotating shifts, but anyway, you get the idea. Um, the um, I'm looking for the quote here. Yeah, Bill Croyle, uh, acting director of the California Department of Water Resources, um, um, stated this is a San Francisco press report, um, stated that. Um, this is the kind of project that would take two or three years to design and two or three years to build. And it's going to be done by November 1st. Okay? So, so if, you know, 
It can be done. Yeah, we can get it done. We can get things done. <laughs> the comment, if everyone didn't hear it, was that, that maybe uh, uh, de Blasio, Mayor de Blasio in New York City, needs to call Jerry Brown to get advice. Uh, or somebody earlier said call Xi Jinping. You know? uh, so um, maybe that's something Jerry Brown could talk about with Xi Jinping, is how to actually do infrastructure. Um, so, so, uh, um, so th this is, you know, we're set for a breakout. We, we, we've got to have one. We've, uh, Helga Zeplarouche put it this way. She said, we're, uh, we're, Americans have got to understand they're in a box. And the rest of the world is outside the box. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, their piss, the pessimism of Americans, the pessimism that we sense is, you know, the, the media, the constant drumbeat or whatever you want to call it, is, is, uh, is, is uh, you know, this inundation with the, the Russia phobia uh, that Putin so effectively addressed uh, at the St. Petersburg Forum, uh, the anti-Trumpism, but just the deep pessimism that goes far deeper than that, you know. I mean, Ohio, you know, the, the, uh, um, the dispatch, uh, the newspaper, uh, in Ohio, uh, just released um, their report. They they did a uh, no one else had done it. They they did a uh, they went county by county to get a picture on the uh, on the death rates from uh, opioid addiction, yeah. right? And and in the last year they had five thousand deaths in the state of Ohio, five thousand deaths, one state. You know, I mean, um, uh, so you know, so the the. Uh, you know, the, the pessimism, uh, it, even if people don't think it's pessimism, maybe they think, oh, well, I'm just practical. You know, the world won't change. I know how things work. That's the pessimism. Um, and, uh, and, and it's time to get outside of the box. We're moving that way. That's what uh, Trump has contributed to um, this last week with his move to, to get out of this um, uh, uh, so-called treaty, which isn't a treaty, but this uh, Paris Agreement or Paris Accord, as it's a, uh, both, it's called both officially. Um, but more, uh, but that comes in the context of this entire sea change, which has been gone ongoing, right? A rejection of globalization, and now a, a, a moves to a new. Uh, what's uh, in China? They're now in English translating or, or using the phrase. Globalization 2.0, uh -huh. right? Uh, of a cooperative approach of win-win. Uh, you know, it's not a matter of the magic of the marketplace, um, and you and you let whoever has the big bucks, you know, carry the day. It's from the standpoint of well, why, how do we work together? What what can we do together? Um, we have these capacities. You have these. Well, how we can how can we do these things together? Bilaterally, multilaterally, and so on and so forth. And that's being that's what's being built up. It's this new set of relations. So what we need now is a, uh, as uh, Will Wirtz was emphasizing uh, Friday, we need a broad political fight um, going on in the United States. We need a mobilization of the American people into this fight. I mean, President Putin addressed it. The world knows it. There's a brawl going in inside the United States in the institutions. Where is the U.S. going? You know, it's not about Russian hackers. You know, it's true. I mean, children could hack, you know, could hack a DNC computer, you know. I mean, who knows? But but as as President Putin of Russia emphasized, and I think you gotta you, you gotta accept it on, on just straightforward, you know, from what you know, you know, hacking elections or manipulating elections, it doesn't happen. Nobody's going to manipulate the outcome of a presidential election, you know, like dancing on strings from some other country. And we're not going to dance the, on strings the Russian elections and so on. It doesn't happen with hacking. Uh, it, this isn't, that's not the real world. So let's drop this. Um, and uh, and uh, let's determine the outcome of this battle going on in, 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 the, in the United States in terms of we're the ones with the uh, scientific outlook, uh, the solutions, specific solutions, 
Uh, LaRouche's four laws, starting with Glass-Steagall implementation, national bank, national credit. You know, China, Japan are, are willing to finance large-scale infrastructure in the United States. Let's get the banking system back organized into an American system, you know, that will allow that to, to be efficient. Um, but again, this, it, it's, it's up to the American people to step forward. We're, we're going to have, for those who are watching this live, we will probably have by Monday um, uh, some, some further direction. Uh, a, a Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur of Ohio uh, and uh, uh, Congressman Walter Jones. Uh, Marcy is a Democrat, uh, Jones is a Republican. Uh, they've moved uh, the, the Glass-Steagall bill as an amendment, they've uh, they've uh, they've uh, they're proposing they proposed it as an amendment uh, to the uh, existing bill, the Henserling bill, uh, Return to Prudent Banking Act bill, HR 790, um, and, and that's their bill. Yeah, that, they, that's bill number ten or something. Oh 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 I'm sorry I did have that wrong. The Financial Choice Act of 2017, that's the Henserling bill, I'm sorry. And that's HR 10. And what they've, they've submitted, the Return to Prudent Banking Act bill, HR 790, which is the Glass-Steagall bill, uh, as an amendment to HR 10, which essentially would turn it inside out. It would turn it into a vehicle for Glass-Steagall. It would basically gut HR 10, which is a hor horrific bill and turn it into its opposite. Um, now, whether that was accepted in committee, uh, which is unlikely, uh, but uh, or was allowed in committee to be brought to the floor as worthy of debate in the process of considering HR 10. Um, uh, anyway, that's it's an open question how we're going to move forward on this. The point is a, a, a floor debate on Glass-Steagall would be a very, very important step at this point. Uh, and so we're just trying to get, we're going to have some further discussions. Um, Lynn, Linda LaRouche, uh, Helga Zepp LaRouche, others will be discussing this um, over the course of the next, uh, over this, the remainder of this weekend. And sometime on Monday, we'll have some further direction on how we want to move to support this effort. Um, you know, we don't want to detract. We don't want to turn it into a, let's go running off of, off, you know, with, uh, half cocked. Uh, we want to be thinking about this uh, in the right way strategically, and 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 how to move on it effectively. But I just want to raise that that this is one of the Glass Steagall is not something just out there. It's a nice idea. It's in the Congress. It's in the House and Senate, um, and uh, we've got congressmen that are want to move on it now, um, and this is one way in which they're trying to move on it. So. Um, uh, let me just conclude my remarks there, and we can open it up for discussion. Yeah, I, yeah. I have understood that, that HR 10 uh, got rid of the uh, Dodd Frank bill, and that by adding this one, <clears throat> by adding Glass Steagall, you've actually had it happen simultaneously, so that you don't, you know, open up the country for total disaster. Well, it. Henserling's bill is not simply doing away with Dodd Frank. It's 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 a deregulation bill. The, the shorthand way in which we presented it is it's going back to Alan Greenspan. Oh, Jesus. It's going back to what we had that that fueled the, the blowout, you know, of 2007, 2009, right? Um, total unregulated. In other words, Dodd Frank imposed certain. Uh, conditions which are onerous to small local banks, community banks, standalone banks, you know, that, that raise their costs of business uh, enormously and they don't have the kind of uh, um, uh, exposure um, to uh, derivatives and speculation, you know, that the money center, big money center banks uh, do. Um, so, but that's been used simply as a, a, a kind of a straw man uh, uh, to say, okay, well, uh, so we're getting rid of Dodd-Frank uh, and we're gonna help out the little banks. But what it's also doing is just basically de deregulating the big banks from even more regulations than they're under now. 
So, uh, I mean, Henserling, Congressman Henserling is reported to be, uh, from the FEC records and so on, the largest single um, rece receiver of, of Wall Street money uh, of any congressman. So, um, so uh, this is not a bill coming from uh, community banks. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're happy to support, you know, it, you know, for their own reasons, but, uh, but uh, overall this is, it's bad news. HR 10, the Hensley bill. But that's, you know, this is part of it. They're trying to rope Trump into su supporting this kind of free market reform type approach. Um, as opposed to Glass-Steagall, which he otherwise has publicly stated he supported. So this is part of this war going on. It's not abstract. It's a war going on. What policies? How do we move? How does Trump move? He's back from his foreign trips, right, which were relatively successful. There's some very positive things coming out of that. Okay, but now there's the domestic agenda. Americans need jobs. They want, uh, they want him to address their, their circumstances, right? So he's got to deliver. If he jumps on board one of these half, half cock schemes, yeah. you know, it's it's going to uh, it's going to be a kind of shipwreck. Um, um, but again, the broader context is the Belt and Road Initiative, the offers coming from abroad. It's a different world, so um, so it's not something to be panicked about. But it's just to understand it, understand what we're working with. Yeah, I was struck by your um, the maps you used of Kenya and also Somalia. Because it, and this this whole, I mean, these kinds of projections for a transcontinental rail line in Africa actually go back to the 1848s and they get sabotaged in various ways. So if you look what's on the table now, the, the Chinese with this new forum, one in Russia right now, 8,000 people, 1,000 Chinese there. The fact that Lynn's program here, Mr. Lewis's program for this International Development Bank, now lay is the basis for this breakout. It's not something projected. It's already happening. Mm -hmm. You see the the context in which to understand the Trump the fight against Trump. Mm -hmm. The whole yeah. fight is right. Yeah. So it's interesting that if people are located at this empire versus the nation states coming together, it's really ground what we're facing mm -hmm. on all fronts. Mm -hmm. Structure there, but just gosh, it mm -hmm. blossoms so much. Yeah. And they're they're actually isolated, so therefore, when you're isolated, there's no growth. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you have something to put in to bring out for them to grow. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I, I know an organization in itself that they these women make the baskets and little bitty things over there. Oh yeah, and they break citizens organization here in Texas and they sell them. Right, right. And Fair trade kind of. Thing a, that they make. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's horrible. Yeah, that, that entire country just rely on coffee or yeah, sugar you know. or. And everybody and can't do that. Yeah. So, I mean, they can't do it. No. For, you know, they can't keep doing it. No. It's, just, yeah, like it's not a human. Yeah. No. yeah. Unbelievable. No, no, it's changing. Yeah. you got to get that down. Yeah. China, China has lifted almost their entire population exactly. out of poverty. <laughs> they have a lot to teach. <laughs> and that they're so willing. That's what they want. They what is, uh, like that. just out of curiosity, um, what is China's human rights record doing right now in relationship to lifting them up out of poverty? Are they also That is human them? rights. That is human rights. No, right? this, so is, this is part of what's got to go out the window. This whole <laughs> phony liberal, and, you, and it's useful to go back and look where this word liberal came from and what it actually means. British liberalism. British liberalism. Um, okay. It's this, you know, it, it's a phony concept you know here they are you know carrying out this massive program to transform the very conditions of life exactly. which is not just about food it's lifting the the, the cultural level mm -hmm. the educational level the, you know the degrees of freedom of action of, of their entire population it, it, you know they're unleashing a process which will right. will shape its own future so that's, that's, so that, that's human, that's, that's, human that's creating rights. human rights. That that's creating human rights. rights. To, to give education. Uh, but I wonder also about freedom of speech issues. I, I feel like we're, we're going in the opposite direction. Like, you know, uh, we're going away from freedom of speech in America. I feel like 
more and more uh, that's being threatened, you know, with free speech zones, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, uh, and then, you know, I don't wonder about the uh, internet if there's uh, actions in our country to, to somehow put a stranglehold uh, on the internet or, or make it so that it, commercial internet is available to us quickly, whereas if you want to go to some website like a like the LaRouche website, you know, where it's going to be really <laughs> slow to see what you guys are doing. So, uh, you know, that's important. But um, is China, in, in addition to what you're mentioning, is it going upward in terms of allowing Literally upward into space. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, upward so into space. Yeah. Upward into space. I, yeah. That's important, you know. They have, but it, it, you, you, you got to. You just have to. I mean, I just encourage everyone to just step back and rethink this whole question of human rights. I mean, human rights has been about, you know, well, we shouldn't tr prosecute drug use. Um, well, you know, there's transgender you know uh -huh. issues um just the same as civil rights right there's you know there, there, uh, political correctness certain words should not be used right right, right. um and then, so people invent new words like snowflake and then people start being upset about the use of the word snowflake oh, maybe, maybe, maybe i'm at uh, <laughs> i don't know what it means snowflake snow people snow. that melt down fast it's, oh, it's a term yeah. used oh. referring to young these young kids that that, you know, on campuses that say that they can't tolerate a certain professor because it makes them uncomfortable, oh, right. right? Or they need a special zone to go to to get away from the from Trump, from Trump being president. It created dissonance, and so they special zones were set up on college campuses where people could go and hug animals and stuff, <laughs> literally, and get over their trauma. Is that all you know, <laughs> those are snowflakes. I mean, I, you know, they, whether you like the term or not, that's what the term is. Really. Wow. So, I mean, you know, the point. Another human rights issue has been moving people out of flood zones. You know, if you're going to build, you know, a huge dam, you move the people out of the way, mm -hmm. right, so that you can provide them right. with energy and, you know, new housing and so forth. And that's it, that's a breach of their human rights. Right, and, and that's they, that not in my backyard, the NIMBY phenomenon, right? Well, really not in my right. backyard. <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't want a steel plant in my backyard, or I don't want a railroad, or I don't want, Garbage or whatever, right? <laughs> Everybody is just about protecting their space, my space, right? I think there was a yeah. <laughs> my space, right? <laughs> 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 Is on this rail line in, in Kenya. Yeah, they have basically four or five young people, you know, looking at their future, their possibilities now, their increase right. in real human rights to uh, grow and Right. As opposed to this NIMBY, not in my backyard, my space, defining what human rights are. The, the whole thing has is, is been completely caught on. Yeah. As opposed to right. me having a responsibility to others, right. you know, to my country and so forth. Certain things have to happen, you know, to, to progress. Okay, well, I got to move and get out of the way, or I've got to do this, or this is for a higher good. It was just understood, you know. Yeah, for the future, there right? By the way, that that yeah. uh, film is called My Railway, My Story. If you go on YouTube, yeah, like Mike, can you connect that, link that for those watching this at home? We'll uh, we'll put a link on the uh, on the YouTube site. Uh, with this, with this uh, uh, feed, or whatever the term is, um, with this link, uh, linking to the the Kenya, um, yeah, I'll do that. story, half how half hour, hour yeah, half hour, hour uh, video and, on and, that. And Brian, mm -hmm. I just want to say that, I mean, if you look back at the last thirty years, right? I mean, you had. Or, or, or go back to the, you know, the, the height of the civil rights movement, you know, and the tremendous moral battle that was going on at that time. And, you know, we, sh our movement at that, you know, which came out of that period with Rouge, you know, what we did is we identified these other so-called human rights movements as an operation to destroy what was intended by the civil rights movement. Hmm. Because the idea was to get 
you know, I've got, you know, long fingernails, you know, that's my identity, right? Or <laughs> I've got, you know, green hair, that's my identity. I mean, look at how many young people today are so incapable of dealing with the world around them because they've been brainwashed into um, an idea that they have some identity that is particular to themselves that is not universal with the rest of humanity. And this is why, how this genocide becomes accepted and tolerated, because people don't identify with humanity or mankind. They identify with their color skin, their, yeah, you know, their color eyes, their, you know, blood and soil land, you know, which is what the whole Nazi dogmas were about. People have been reduced from being human to be, being what we put out a whole pamphlet about 20 years ago or so, Palmerston Zoo. You know, people are all different species of animals in one big British manipulated or imperial manipulated zoo. And they started this pushing. You each have your separate cage. Each, yeah, each species has its own has its own exactly. cage. You, own, you know, the bikers have their cage. You know, the, the this have their cage. They did this. And, you know, the whole um, Confederacy, in fact, was part of that project. They were pushing this in the mid, you know, starting in the early 1800s, in reaction to the American Revolution and the potential that was actually created at that point by the by the true leaders of the American Revolution, people like Hamilton, who were fighting to end the abomination of slavery at that time. And so they created this whole movement through their intelligence services Are we still running all over the world to get, you know, all kinds of nationalistic, regionalistic movements underway, which prevented other nations from carrying out something similar to the American Revolution in potential. And, and part of their operation was to provide the United States. Today, we're just seeing the most extreme form of that, where people are not even considering themselves Americans or whatever. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I... Well, you have, you have it right now with the, uh, with uh, Jerry Brown and some yeah, of these other governors saying that they're, they're going to split off, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to ally, ally with the Paris Agreement. Right. And, and basically, they're going to make their own foreign policy for the, for their part of the country. You know, they're going to secede from that union. And Texas union. Is saying, we want to cure the drought of California, so those Californians don't come here. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't we, we end the show here at this point, and we can continue.